Well, it is a privilege, as I say again, David, thank you for all the work you put into this evening. It's a privilege to have David with us. Many of you here know David. He is the director of the Albanian Evangelical Mission. He's a member here at the church, Bradley Road Baptist Church, and he's speaking to us this evening on the birth of the English Bible from Alfred to Tyndale. Thank you, David. Well, the title, as you can see, I think, of the um, talk is some pre-1611 English scripture. So although most of the uh, celebration is about the actual 1611 authorized King James Version, I offered to give a little talk, or, well, a talk anyway, um, about what came before. Uh, I was hoping to be able to stand right in front of it on the screen so I could actually face you all the time, but uh, it's a little bit too small for me to read from this distance. So I'm going to have to turn around, but if I keep this thing uh, before me, you will at least be able to hear. And uh, the verse, of course, is the uh, story of the prodigal son, which is in Old English. He quath soudlich a sum man have the twain sunna. Tha quath se uldra to his father, father, sulem e mina dal minra achter, they may to ye bureth. Tha dal de he him his achter, that after fewa darum, ere his thing gagatheroda, se jungere sunno, on fair do brachlicher, on fair and richer. Now, that is the gospel in old English. And that's really uh, how it started. We think that Bede, those are the dates of his life, uh, and he was a monk at Jarrow. We believe that he translated John's Gospel. Uh, in, in fact, he was ill, he was old, uh, for those days anyway, and, and, and he was writing away, and his uh, scribe was sitting there taking down what he was dictating, and there was just a little bit more to go, and he, he, he hung on, and, and he got to the end, and his scribe said, it's finished, we've done it. And very shortly after as he died. But sadly... That translation has been lost. It's not been preserved. Whether the Vikings destroyed it or all the copies have vanished, we don't know. So we can only say it's believed that the first English translation uh, of Scripture was done by Bede, the monk of Jarrow. You can still go to Jarrow today and it's a big presentation called Bede's World. Uh, And uh, we, we believe that that was the first time the Scriptures were rendered into English. But we do come to Alfred the Great. Now, you might remember there was a sort of competition on television some while ago. Uh, Who do you think was the greatest Englishman? And people were voting for Churchill and I don't know who else. Uh, I would have voted for King Alfred the Great if I had been there. And uh, it says he was in the habit uh, at night time of going without his household knowing to various churches in order to pray. He similarly applied himself to charity and distribution of alms. That was written by Bishop Asser, uh, one of his helpers and advisors, who was actually a Welshman. And uh, that's the sort of king that began to bring into England uh, a better knowledge of Scripture. You also see um, the dates of his reign there. And that statue, I took the photograph of it, in Winchester, which, of course, was his capital. Now, when Alfred came to the throne, England had been largely overrun by Danish Vikings. And what he inherited from uh, his father and brothers who'd been king before him was largely a ruined kingdom, uh, you can see, not very, very well, I'm afraid, it's only a a somewhat faint black and white map, but if you could see it uh, very clearly, a lot of England had already been lost, and uh, it got smaller. There were further military reverses, so we had that to deal with, as well as his prayers, as well as his arms giving. And then we get to the Battle of Ethandun, or Eddington, as it's called today, 878. Now that was a turning point. It it seems to me that God so often gives a turning point because the the Danes, of course, were pagans and the English were Christians. I I don't mean they were all born again 
by inward faith. I mean, who knows who can look on the heart? Uh, But they were at least nominally Christian. The Danes were openly pagan. They were taking over the country. uh, And it came to this big battle in the time of Alfred. Now, if you go up the downs there, it's near Eddington, which is in Wiltshire, obviously. Uh, There's a plaque, which is very nice, I think, a nice plaque to that battle. And that was when the tide turned. And uh, I've been there, and I thought, here we had a Christian king, and the land was threatened by pagans and invasion, and the tide was turned. And I prayed to God there with thanks that our culture and our heritage were saved from being completely overrun and lost. Now, this is what Alfred Alfred himself wrote, Remember what punishments befell us in this world when we ourselves did not cherish learning nor submit it to other men. We were Christians in name only, and very few of us possessed Christian virtues. That's the sort of king England needs today, if I might say so, and not only today, but always. And uh, he was a sincere uh, man who really wanted to walk with God. And part of his spare time, you imagine what it's like running a kingdom, running a war, part of his spare time he decided he would translate the Psalms into English. And here you see uh, part of his 23rd psalm, Drichten me rat, ne bith me, nanus godus wan, and he me ye set on swi the god feochland, and fede me be watera statham, and been mowed ye huirvde of unhrodnesa on ye fern, and so on. What a thing for a king to do. My people need the word of God. I'm going to start translating it. And he died um, in, 18, uh, sorry, in 899. He hadn't finished his translation. It was carried on by other people. And there is a, a translation of the whole book of Psalms, not the whole Bible, but the whole book of Psalms, uh, with I think the first 50 or 51. They numbered them differently. You know one of them is, is split into two in some versions and joined into one in others. Uh, so round right about Psalm 50, 51, he couldn't get any further, but it was carried on. William of Malmesbury, the historian, wrote that death prevented Alfred from finishing his translation of the Psalms. Well, that's when it began. And then we had another deeply religious, devout king, King Edgar. And those are the dates of his reign. He was favorable to the reform of English life because after all the destruction which the Danish pagan invasions had brought, there was a, there was a lot of loss and Alfred, Alfred began rebuilding. But then you've got this man. And think of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. You don't need to look it up. Uh, I can't quote it word for word, but it's that uh, passage which tells us we are to pray for all who are in authority, for kings and others who rule over us, so that we can live as Christians godly and peaceful lives. And that was the kind of man that uh, King Edgar was, and he was encouraging the reform and development of the church after those turbulent years. And Dunstan, Archbishop of Canterbury, those are the dates when he was Archbishop, he was the central figure in English religious life. What did he say? I beg you, kindly Christ... To protect me, Dunstan, and do not allow the storms of the underworld to swallow me up. And that picture, uh, it's believed that he did that self-portrait himself. There is Dunstan uh, dressed as a monk and an enormous, victorious, conquering Christ sitting there on the throne in the glory of God and a tiny little man... uh, What an attitude for the Archbishop of Canterbury to have. I'm small, Christ is great. And praying to him, protect me, Dunstan. Do not let me be uh, swallowed up by the storms of the underworld. That's the kind of men that God raised up. Now, out of that sort of religious development, round about that time, round about the time of King Edward, there came uh, that translation which I started off with, 
um, of the whole Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I have a copy at home. That's why I was able to scan it, of course. And here's the beginning of the prodigal son, and it's called the West Saxon Gospels. Not exactly known when or who or where it was translated into English, round about the year 1000. And uh, I've already read some of it to you, the first four lines, and then it says, And for spilder thar his achter, livender on his jarl son. So that is what happened to the prodigal son, and that's how it was discovered uh, to the Anglo-Saxons. Here you see a handwritten version, because, of course, they didn't have printing in those days. Now, can you imagine, I, I, I don't even know if this was possible, but if it was possible, if you were rich enough, how much would you have to pay somebody to sit down and write out by hand the whole of the Gospels, let alone anything more. And it, it, it's not so easy. I mean, we get, the, we get printing and it's easy to read. And they didn't have electric lights either for the writer or the reader. Uh, it's, it was just so much more difficult and you had to be keen, really keen, to uh, get hold of this sort of stuff. But people were doing it. People were translating. People were writing. And it's interesting that you can still buy a copy of the Old English Gospels, if you want to, to this day, published by the Early English Text Society, of course. And then there came um, one of my heroes in the Christian life. I've given a talk here on his life and work, uh, one of our midweek uh, meetings some months or even years ago, Alfrich. Now, that gatehouse of the monastery at St. Abbot, of course, is much later and it's not functioning as a monastery now. Apart from the gatehouse, it's just ruins. But he was a monk, and in 987, he took charge of the teaching that was going on, sort of a school or the new monks at um, the monastery in Cernabus, which is in Dorset. Come on. Now, this is what he said. It's thought that ye waldon thurth a wonderlichen racha ewa moda windan to goddess willan on ernost. Which means, I intended that you should wish by means of the wonderful narrative to turn your heart earnestly to God's will. Now what wonderful narrative is this? Well he translated most of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua and Judges. And, of course, there was, around about the same time, the, the um, gospel stories as well being translated and circulated. There were men who loved the scriptures in those far-off days. He, uh, one of the things I like, he, he wrote to the Bishop of Sherborne and uh, exhorted him to make sure that he was preaching. He said, we've got to have preaching. That's what you're there for. Don't forget what God's called you to do. And uh, probably not many people write to bishops like that these days. But there you go. It was in his heart. And if you read his sermons, which are also still in print, uh, you can get them in translation or in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, they're just so full of Christ. They're not only full of Christ, uh, but they're full of the idea that you have to have repentance in your heart. Okay, he's a, he's a Benedictine monk, but he's not just into ceremony and all that. He says, you must believe. Uh, you, you've got to have personal faith. You must come to Christ in personal repentance for your sins. And uh, he, his writings, are they, I find them quite exciting. They, they, they give me a buzz when I read them. And uh, he wrote his sermons and he said, right, we're going to have good preaching in the churches in this area. And he got, presumably, the monks in the scriptorium to, to write them out as he dictated them. And they were circulated to the churches. Um, there's about 80 of them in, uh, have survived. Circulated to the churches to be preached, because a lot of the village priests, of course, were not particularly well educated um, in those days. And it's lovely to see these people trying to get the message into people's hearts and minds. So he translated most of Genesis to Judges, as I just said. Here's Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. God quoth thou to Abraham, far of thee and of thee in Ramagha and of thee as father's husa, and come to them land of they itch they as and itch makia they meet your mother, 
and they are blessed and then a name and it's your mercy and through this your blessed. Well, the promise to Abraham. What a wonderful thing that is in any language. The promise that God will bless you and make you great. And this is what Henry Soames, the Chancellor of St. Paul's Cathedral, wrote in his biography of Alfrich. While England bled at every pore, this is because of the continuing Viking troubles, invasions, raids. While England bled at every pore, an admirable genius laboured indefatigably to lighten her distress by furnishing a rich supply of sound instruction, a stream of healing knowledge to mend and comfort evil times. We need to pray for all the pastors here that their ministry will be like that these days. We really do. That's the kind of man we're talking about. He might have looked like this. Um, they, they took all the local faces of men, uh, photographs I suppose, and, and fed them into a computer and said to the computer, what does the average man in the Oxford area look like? Because he, uh, he, he moved from being a monk to being the abbot, uh, the first abbot of Ensham, as it says there in the year 1005. So that's what the average man in the Oxford area looks like. And uh, perhaps he looked like that. They put a a nice monk's uh, habit on him. But, of course, we don't know. And uh, when we meet him in glory, he will be transfigured like our Lord Jesus Christ is transfigured and will be glorious. But I'm sure recognizable to those who knew him. And that was what the abbey was like uh, when it first started off. Just a a, a small enclosure, the big church and places there for the monks to live and 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 work so 1005 the first abbot of that place you can still go there again like the one at St Abbas it's in ruins now and Bremer uh, Bremer is a, is a village in Hampshire and you can't see it very clearly uh, I couldn't really get a very clear angle and the writing anyway is, is quite faint over the arch but that arch is in the church in Bremer and the words are, Her swutla serio quidradnus they, which means, Here the covenant is revealed to you. I, I, I think that's great. What a lovely thing to happen. People coming to Bradley Road Baptist Church and the other churches that you um, represent tonight, and the covenant which God has made with man through Christ is revealed to them. That's what we want. And uh, I love the way that is there. It's a church from the Saxon times, one of the very few that are still standing in England. And here you have uh, Psalm 119 in the 1611 version. I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. But my heart standeth in awe, of thy word, my soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. Well, may that be the testimony of all of us. Amen.